Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, this is the last day of January, which definitely felt like a pretty long month for all of us. Uh, and we're definitely moving right along with the quarter. This is the fifth week, so we're approaching the midpoint of the quarter. And as a result, I want to give you the tools and things that you need to know in order to best prepare and know what to expect. I know we've got a lot of folks joining for Zoom today, so welcome. Glad you made it. Uh, so for this week, I, I wanted to let you know first about the uh, small group reflection essay. So I am hopefully going to be able to get the feedback to you on Friday. The reason I'm waiting until Friday is because of uh, folks that might have used their get out of jail free card to turn it in at the latest by this Wednesday. Um, I don't want to return feedback until everybody has turned the essay in uh, in order to be here for everybody. So I'm going to hold off until that point. But I do want to give you the opportunity to use the feedback to help for later assignments in the course. In fact, uh, we'll be having uh, the next shorter writing assignment coming up here. And I'm going to be using some time today to help you prepare and brainstorm. We'll be going over that assignment, including what you should expect and some of the ways that you can do well on that one. Uh, the next writing assignment, which will be uh, an assessment of the group work that you've been doing so far in the class, is going to be due on February 13th. That gives you, again, uh, two weeks. I like to be reasonable and give you two weeks to work on and start to plan for this assignment. And I also uh, wanted to give you a bit of a breather after you finished writing the previous assignment um, for starting on this one. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But before we do, I want to go over a concept that's new for this week uh, that'll tie to the prompt that I'm going to ask you to complete as part one of your attendance. So this week, we're going to be looking at problem solving and the way that people, as part of small groups, work together to try to resolve and deal with issues, right? This builds on a lot of the points that we've been talking about over the course of the quarter. For instance, early on, we talked about how, as part of a group, right, you occupy different shit, you take on different roles. Uh, as part of a group, you have to figure out how to listen and engage with other people. But we've also talked about the role that things such as culture and identity can play in the process. You can think about any type of group that you're a part of, and chances are, right, that there are some types of problems or goals that your group is going to try to resolve or deal with. Uh, for instance, as one example, if you're a member of the philosophy club, and the philosophy club is going to put on a symposium where they talk about a lot of issues and topics related to philosophy, right? The philosophy club says, okay, we're going to put together this symposium. Now, that's going to be a problem that has a lot of different steps that are important to resolve and to figure out in order to get that symposium put together, right? For instance, the group has to start by defining what the problem or issue is. We have this idea for a symposium, but we're not quite sure how to pull it together or to make the symposium work, right? So they're defining and figuring out what that issue is. Secondarily is analyzing the problem. Analyzing a problem or issue means breaking it down to its different parts. This is something that you've been doing in class in the various uh, group activities that we've been doing. For instance, in the very first day of class, we did an activity for your uh, extra credit where you were talking through uh, and having a conversation with group members about what you shared in common. We did the survival exercise where you were ranking items based on their importance if you crash land in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we had the activity uh, where someone joins the hiking club, right, and he's trying to figure out how to interact with other people. We also had the pre-listening activity where we were thinking about ways to create a good environment for something like uh, an interview, right? Uh, and so we've had a lot of opportunities to discuss and do some group work uh, in class that have helped you to analyze and break down, down what that problem is, right? You're part of a uh, philosophy club that's putting together a symposium, you're going to analyze and figure out the various things that the group needs to do. For instance, putting together uh, a physical space or venue, figuring out who's going to present, figuring out how you're going to advertise or distribute this event and so on. Another idea here is 
the idea of criteria, right? So if you ever look through an assignment and you see something like a rubric or guidelines, that's the criteria. That's the way that that assignment is going to be graded. And so you look at that knowing what you need to do in order to do well, right? In the same way, establishing criteria when a group is solving problem means the group members figuring out how they're going to define success and figure out how they're going to assess whether or not they've solved the problem. For instance, maybe putting together philosophy symposium means that the group members are able to have a physical space, they're able to have a date and time, and they're able to uh, sufficiently advertise it so that they have a good turnout. So that could be an example of the criteria the group puts together. The fourth thing is to consider possible solutions, right? That means as a member of the group, you and other people are trying to figure out what possible options there are uh, for resolving the issue. For instance, putting together a philosophy symposium, maybe you say, okay, we can have it over in Ackerman. Um, no, I think we should actually have it over in Losa, right? Or maybe your group members are debating whether or not to host this symposium face-to-face -face or virtual or do something like a hybrid option, right? Um, in this case, you're weighing the different possibilities and options, trying to figure out what to do. And that's where a lot of that brainstorming in groups and synergy can really develop. The transition from four to five is probably one of the hardest parts of working and functioning effectively within a group, right? And it's easy to think about why. Uh, oftentimes, when you're participating or joining in a group, it's easy to add ideas or to add perspectives or to float out uh, different ideas on what to do. But it can be a lot harder to make the decisive approach of deciding what to do given those options. In fact, one of the ways that groups don't function effectively is when they're all ideas and brainstorming, but they don't come to a decision or they don't do anything, right? So part of working well in a group is about winnowing things down and really deciding on what to do to resolve the issue. Maybe your group decides, you know what, for this philosophy symposium, we're gonna have it as a hybrid option. That's the best way to ensure participation face-to-face -face and virtual. You implement the solution, right? You decide to host it, you create the Zoom meeting, you also create the physical location on, can, on campus, you use emails and flyers and other things in order to get people attending the symposium, right? And then after the group uh, accomplishes the task or problem, you follow up on it. You did the symposium, uh, what went well? Well, there were some really interesting ideas and questions. Maybe there were things you could have done to increase attendance or to increase preparation so that more people knew further ahead of time to go. Uh, in that way, right, when we work in groups on solving a problem or dealing with an issue, we're taking these different steps to heart. Uh, and I think we'll be able to look into how we do these steps in small groups in a lot more detail for this week. So what I'd like us to do for today uh, is, as part one, of your attendance credit, I want you to think about some of the small activities that we've been doing in class. Now, I know not everybody has had the chance to go and do every one of them. So if you're absent and missed a couple of them, that's okay, right? I want you to think about one of the group activities we've done in class. It could be, again, um, the survival activity, be our activity on the first day where we were getting to know and finding things we had in common with each other. Um, it could be the activity with the hiking group, be the activity where we were trying to create a good listening environment for people interviewing. Uh, we had one or two others, right? Uh, so pick one of those small group activities. And what I want you to think about is how your group participated in that process of problem solving, including the seven steps of problem solving that we just went over. So I'll return to that slide in just a minute. Uh, so explain how your group did those seven steps of problem solving, first of all. And then secondarily, I want you to think about what went well and what, went, what was missing in working through those steps. For example, maybe your group did the survival activity. They did a really good job of picking potential ideas, but maybe they didn't do as well in deciding on an idea and moving forward on that idea to solve the issue, right? Uh, so yeah, think about how you use these steps to address the issue and the things that went well and didn't as part of that process of group problem solving.
sunset in a right here. Moving to the next slide, real quick. Thank you.
give you about two more minutes to work on this. Like most of you are about wrapped up. So go ahead and finish the first thought or idea that you're working on. Uh, don't turn this in yet. It will be a part two that we'll do in just a little bit. So the good news is that the work that I asked you to start to think about when you were applying the ways that you did problem solving in your groups in class is already set up to get you to start thinking about the next writing assignment for the course. So we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But before we do, I want to do a quick recap of the things that we went over last week. Last week, we talked about systems, right? And the idea that the structure of a government or organization, right, is really reflective of the values and beliefs that members of that group hold. For example, we looked at the country of Lebanon, in which uh, its governmental organization and representatives are based on the different cultural and religious orientations of the group, showing the way that that group's government is representative of the different cultures or perspectives that are offered within that group, too. So we talked a little bit about that. We talked about international communication, right? The idea that people from different nationalities and areas of focus are able to um, communicate in unique ways. We looked at the case study, right, of ongoing tensions between the United States and Russia regarding expansion in Ukraine as an example of how context and history shape the way that we can look at that relationship. We also talked about theories X, Y, and Z, which are different approaches that help us to understand uh, the ways that we think about people and the way that people participate in groups. International communication, right, refers again to beliefs and attitudes among people of different nations and the ways that those can create both uh, potential for miscommunication, but also increased learning, right, and ideas that can come in from outside perspectives. We also talked again about these three different theories. Uh, does anybody want to take a stab at reminding us from last week what theory X is? Yeah, kind of. Um, it's the one that people don't like to look. Sure. Right. So theory X is pessimistic about how people behave in groups, right? It's kind of mentioned, it's the idea that people don't like to work or don't want to or feel a lot of motivation to work. And the reason for that is because people have other needs that come first, things like basic food, water, shelter, security, and so on. People would be more likely or more willing to work if some of their basic needs at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy are met. That self-determination, doing the best job that you can in a group is something you're comfortable doing once those other major needs are being Theory Y, on the other hand, 
are the optimists, right? Theory Y covers people who are much more interested in participating in a group who are motivated to do well. So theory Y assumes that people do want to work uh, and are going to pursue uh, on their own the best job that they can. And then theory Z is the balancing act between the two. It says, yes, people do want to work and participate, uh, but it also means that people are motivated by some of those core needs. Andrew, you had a question, what's up? Oh, no, it's okay. I was going to explain the theory why, but it's okay. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Oh, no, you already explained it. I was going to say, like, people are really ambitious and self-directed and, yeah, like what you said. Sure, sure. Um, so, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off uh, on that. But, yes, you're absolutely right that under theory why, right, people are very interested in collaborating uh, and working together. They're ambitious. I like the way that you bring that in. Um, but yes, the theory Z, again, is that balance between the two. These are ways that we can think about how people act in groups, right? So those were some of the things that we covered last week, again, getting at the role of culture and the way that culture impacts our participation and engagement in groups. This class and for this week, uh, I want to talk first about the next writing assignment. I also want to talk a bit about decision making and some of the different approaches that we can do as far as reaching a uh, decision when we participate in groups too. So we'll be going over some of the different methods and ways that people reach a decision as they're participating in groups. So to start us off, uh, I would like to go ahead and um, share on Canvas for you the prompt and the expectations for the next writing assignment of the course. So if you go to this course's page, and you scroll down to week six, uh, you'll notice that the small group assessment is listed here. Again, this assignment was originally going to be due at the end of this week, but that's not fair to you all, given the snow and delays and so on, right? I wanted to push that back to you to give you uh, at least the full two weeks to work on and develop this assignment. So if you go here, right, you on February 13th, and like for the first assignment of the course, the prompt is available, including the rubric and uh, the detailed guidelines for this assignment. So, as we mentioned, right, in the first few weeks of the quarter, had the opportunity to participate in some of these small group activities in class. For instance, uh, the icebreaker where we were getting to know each other, the survival activity, the activity where you were asked to think about how Luis could fit into the hiking club, the activity where you were creating a good listening environment uh, for an interview, and so on, right? Um, so, what I want you to do is to think through these group activities and your participation in class uh, as a way to apply uh, some of these ideas that we've been talking about from the course. Like last time, should be two pages, double spaced, including in-text citations and a work cited list. Uh, you can also, again, either choose to have numbered paragraph responses or just have it as a continuous paragraph. But what I'm asking you to do is first, thinking about the groups that you participated in and the activities that you completed. First of all, how do you approach problem solving? The good news is you already started to brainstorm and think about that when you were thinking about the steps of problem solving at the very beginning of class, right? So I want you to explain what those different steps of problem solving are. Also, the steps of group decision that we'll be talking about for today. And use that to help justify your answer. Again, like last time, one thing that will help a lot in getting a good grade and doing well is to give me specific examples. In this group, we used a consensus approach because we all agreed this was the most important survival layer. Secondarily, uh, we talked uh, during week three about the role of listening and the way listening shapes the way that we participate in groups. I want you to think about listening and some of the ways that you practiced good listening as a part of being involved in the group. You should also draw from the text, including some of the steps involved in good and effective listening to help support your answer. In particular, what I'm looking for for this section of the prompt is for you to identify what some of the challenges are, right, of listening in groups and some of the ways that listening in groups is different than listening just independently uh, to somebody else. And then lastly, as we talked about last week, uh, the role of culture and diversity, of course, is really important for thinking about how we behave in groups. I want you to think about your own cultural identity and perspective and the ways that your own culture and perspective that you brought to the table 
has shaped the way that you participated in groups. For instance, maybe everybody that you've worked with has been a different gender. And so that's been different in terms of how you relate to or engage with members of the group. So I want you to think a little bit here about culture and the way that culture relates to uh, some of the things you've done in this class. So those again are the three parts that you'll answer in that about two pages long assignment. Uh, and the next page, like before, also have the rubric available for you, which goes over the ways that I'll be grading. Structure, referring to the organization of the essay, and style, referring to the conventions and use of citations, or just like last time. Um, and again, I'll be using feedback uh, for you on Friday as a way to help you to think about some of the changes or improvements you could make in your own writing. As far as substance, I'm looking at you identifying problem solving, making decisions in a group, part of that first question, um, the way that you use listening to respond to the second part of the problem, and then the way that you discuss issues surrounding culture and diversity as it connects to groups. So again, these uh, prompts as part of this assignment directly tie into the things you've been talking about in uh, weeks three through five. So it should be pretty straightforward as you're working through this. I would imagine the questions might be coming up as you're working through this or starting to brainstorm um, or put this together. I do want to check in and see though, at this point, if you have any questions that immediately come to mind or things that I could do right away to help you as you're working through it. I'll also mention that uh, like last time, I'm happy to look at graphs, uh, outlines, or if you want to come to office hours, face-to-face -face or through Zoom, I can work with you on the project as well. I had a couple of people who came in and worked with me on rough drafts and that went really well for them. So you can definitely do that if you're concerned about your grade or just want to do well in the assignment. So uh, getting into some of the new stuff that relates to the way that groups make decisions and solve problems. Uh, shifting gears here, I want to check in. Has anybody heard the term cost benefit before? Cost benefit analysis before? Sounds like it's a pretty new term for folks. So here's a way to think about this. Say you have family that lives maybe about a two hour drive away, right? You're coming here to EOU, maybe you live in the dorms, and you have family uh, that, you know, is maybe a little bit more central in Oregon. So maybe you're trying to decide for yourself if you're gonna go see that your family over the weekend. There's a lot of things that could go into your decision, right? There's a lot of benefits. For instance, you get to catch up on family that you haven't seen them in a long time. Maybe uh, they have a piece of clothing that you left at their house that you can grab again. Uh, maybe there are a lot of reasons that it's good for you to see family. Those would be benefits. And most of those benefits would be social, right? But there's also costs that you have to consider. First of all, uh, the cost of gas or transportation, right, is a literal physical cost. Um, the time that it would take you to drive out there, um, and also the way that it would impact things like being caught up on your classes. Um, maybe it can be really socially or emotionally draining. You're a more introverted person and don't enjoy uh, that you would. Uh, be drained by the end of the weekend, right? Uh, so those are costs to consider too, right? Uh, what cost-benefit analysis suggests is that for us, as we participate and work in groups, right, we're making these kind of calculations. Maybe you decide, you know what, I'd love to see my family, but the costs outweigh the benefits. I just, this is not a good time of year for me. I really am kind of worn out and trying to catch up in my classes. I've got a bunch of exams. And so I'm going to wait and do it at another time. You assess that the net benefits, that is benefits minus costs, right, are not worth it. The costs outweigh. In the same way, when we're working together in groups, you're making that calculation all the time. We're thinking about whether or not certain decisions are worth it. Again, to go to the example of the philosophy symposium, right, if you decide that hosting face to face is more costly, could hurt with COVID, it means you're probably not going to get very many people so on, you might decide it's more beneficial to switch over virtually. So core idea of the way we make decisions in groups is really to consider 
the best or the most net beneficial option for everybody. This gets at the core of what decision making is when we're participating in groups, right? And decision making in groups means that we are working together to reach some type of solution or resolution to a particular problem for you. Again, you're hosting a philosophy symposium, you're trying to decide how to host it, what's going to happen at the symposium, and so on. That's the problem or issue, and decision making is getting it. Uh, so, one thing to think about, of course, is uh, the way that things such as power and decision-making authority can impact the process. Uh, I've talked to a lot of folks who are involved in things like athletics or extracurriculars, right? And a lot of people have said, have said wow, like my schedule got completely canceled or you know, we were gonna go do this game and this competition and it got canceled and moved around. Uh, oftentimes, right, those decisions to cancel or to move around or to change your schedule are things that you don't get to decide. You don't get to say, oh, hey, I'm not going to go to this game this weekend. Bye, right? Oftentimes, it's because your coach or your team leader or captain has made that decision for you, right? So in groups, we don't always have the authority to make a decision ourselves. Sometimes there's people that have a unilateral level of power uh, in that process, but it's still worth considering how Decision making is uh, something that we can do in a collaborative capacity. So there are five major types of ways that groups make a decision. And I want to go over some of the details and things to know about these different types and methods. Again, I want to go back to the example of the philosophy symposium and the idea that people are working together to figure out when and where and how uh, that event can be hosted, right? One example here is what's called kind of funnily, a plot. A plot being the idea that a group cannot make a decision or reach a solution. Maybe they've suggested an option or a way to resolve the issue, but they're not able to act on it, right? Under the example of a plot, it's not always a bad thing. In fact, uh, kicking the can down the road can be a good approach if you feel like you need more information, more time, if people really need to think through and evaluate the issue. For instance, if you were part of a group that was interviewing somebody for a job and you said, you know what, uh, we're not quite sure who to hire yet. Maybe we give it a week and you know, sleep on it, mull it over and come back the following week to figure out what our decision is. So sometimes uh, plop is okay, but procrastinating, taking it down the road, can also be a problem because the longer you wait to make a decision, the more likely it is that the decision you make is rushed and not well thought out. Uh, or um, it can oftentimes mean that you make the decision too late. If you decide on who to hire and give them an offer, but they've already taken a job somewhere else, right? You've lost that person and that opportunity. So not making a decision or choosing to push back on a decision can be useful in groups, but other times it's not a good idea. Delegating to an expert, right, is another important consideration. Uh, so maybe you as a group decide that you're just in over your heads. For instance, you don't know uh, if this philosophy symposium should be held face-to-face -face or virtually, and you decide to contact a professor in the philosophy program to see from their perspective what we should do. Um, you decide that you don't have the power or the authority or the expertise yourself and you kick it over to somebody. That can be useful, again, to get somebody that has expertise or knowledge, but it can also be used negatively to avoid taking responsibility or making a decision where you have the power to do something, but you're telling somebody else to do it. And it can also be a problem if the expert that you delegate to doesn't necessarily agree with or understand what's happening, right? If the person, you talk to about the philosophy symposium, doesn't know what the symposium is going to look like or what you're going to do at the event, it's going to be a lot harder for them to make a decision. Averaging, right? Averaging is the idea of compromise, working together or meeting in the middle, right? So this is something we talk a lot about in conflict management, which is class and column that a couple of you have taken before. Uh, so the idea of averaging will be to really take into account everybody's perspective. But averaging also uh, assumes 
that there is some type of loss that people take, right? Um, the idea, the sort of trope, right, of compromise is that nobody's happy in a compromise. In fact, uh, sometimes that's been criticized. For instance, the idea of like splitting a baby in half is not compromised because there's not a baby in it, right? Uh, so compromise can be a problem um, in terms of making everybody not feel satisfied. But sometimes meeting in the middle is necessary to get everybody willing to move forward. Maybe some people feel strongly that the symposium is face-to-face. -face. Other people say it has to be online. You decide to hold the symposium in a hybrid form. Uh, therefore, we're trying to meet in the middle and get everybody uh, in at least some level of agreement. Voting. So voting uh, is important to think about because yes, you can do voting in a purely democratic way, right? You can do voting through a simple majority where 50% plus one is who gets it in a way of deciding that has two options. But another way of thinking about voting is in the context of a plurality. Are folks familiar with the difference between majority and plurality? A couple people nodding, a couple people shaking their heads. I'll give you one classic historical example, right? So when former President Bill Clinton ran um, in uh, the 90s, right, uh, he didn't necessarily, depending on the state or location, receive a majority of votes, uh, but still won the presidency and still won particular states uh, because it was a race between three major candidates, right? Clinton, his Republican opponent, and uh, the third party candidate, Ross Perot, who ran in both of those races, right? As a result, he didn't necessarily break the 50% threshold in states, but he won the plurality of votes. So voting could also be through plurality, right? Maybe there's three or four candidates or three or four options, and uh, the one that has the most votes wins, even if it's not the majority. Another model is the two-thirds majority. This is a model that we actually see um, in a lot of situations, for instance, in the United Nations, right? The United Nations Security Council has uh, requirements for two-thirds majority. It also holds a kind of interesting constraint in that members of the UN, um, what's considered the five permanent members, including the United States, Russia, France, uh, China, and Germany, Right, have the ability to veto uh, decisions. There are a lot of cases where on contentious issues of international policy, one of the countries like the US vetoes a potential UN resolution. Anyway, in some examples of voting, it's required to do a two thirds vote because of maybe how controversial or important the issue is. There has to be a larger critical mass of support in order to get the thing done. And then lastly is the idea of consensus, right? Consensus being that everybody eventually signs on to or, uh, or ends up doing something, right? Consensus is important because it means that um, everybody ultimately votes for something and you don't have people that disagree that are just around that. Consensus can be useful because it allows people to feel like they're all involved and everybody's approach is being considered. There's nobody left behind, right? But the biggest concern about consensus is that not necessarily everybody is actually going to agree or really uh, support what the group ultimately decides. That can seem a little bit confusing or misleading, but it's important to think about this in the context of groupthink. Groupthink, uh, for those of you that have taken conflict management or similar course, probably familiar. It's the idea when you're in a group, you're more likely to self-censor to not share your perspective because you don't want to rock the boat. Uh, for instance, everybody goes, sees, goes and sees the new Spider-Man movie, says it's great, but you say, I didn't really like it. And you realize that if you told the group that you didn't like it, they would just get mad at you, they'd make fun of you, maybe um, you just don't want to share your opinion. And you say, eh, I kind of liked it too, right? You self-censor or choose not to share your opinion for the good of the group. Similarly, we use that all the time to avoid sharing our true opinions, to avoid uh, creating disagreement, and out of a desire to be conflict-free, right? As a result of that, 
just because we arrive at a consensus decision, just because everybody says, oh yeah, hybrid format like makes sense, let's do it. That doesn't mean that everybody wants to do a hybrid format. There could be some people that say, I'd rather do it face-to-face, -face, but they say, you know what, this is okay. Other people want to do it, so I'll do it too. So consensus does not mean that everybody agrees, um, just that everybody is willing to or signs on to the thing. So there are some challenges of different forms of reaching a decision. Obviously, consensus has a lot of benefits because it means that everybody can work together and feel good about the option. Uh, but obviously, there's concerns. One of them being that everybody needs to know what consensus means. Consensus is not a majority vote. It's that everybody, to some extent, is on board with the plan. Consensus also means everybody needs to participate, right? If somebody is not talking, you can't really make a consensus because that person has not shared their opinion. It's important to listen, obviously, be open and honest, uh, to understand the perspectives everybody brings to the table. Consensus takes a lot of time, right? It requires a lot of patience to get everybody on board. Looking for mutually accepted ways to solve problems is a good idea, right? Starting with points of commonality and where people agree is important. The idea of gridlock being this idea of an insurmountable conflict where two people are just diametrically opposed to each other um, is an important issue to deal with, right? What are the core values or beliefs or assumptions that are guiding this disagreement? Is there a collaborative solution that considers these concerns? Some people think it's really valuable to have a face-to-face -face presence in this symposium. Other people say it's important for accessibility to have it remotely. So maybe a hybrid format can resolve the growth problem. So consensus can be useful, but it does carry some constraints as well. There's an interesting term too that's known as analysis paralysis, which is a kind of fun rhyme. Uh, analysis paralysis gets at the idea that oftentimes if there are so many options and possibilities and just so much information, we can feel overwhelmed and unable to make, it, make a decision. Really good example of this is that you can use like your phone or computer or TV or whatever to watch uh, shows on or movies on a streaming service like Hulu or Netflix or Disney Plus, right? If you're like me, uh, sometimes you'll say, there's so much, there's so much available, there's nothing I want to watch. Like, and you spend like an hour browsing through movies and shows and all that and being like, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch that. I don't know what to watch, right? That's an example of analysis paralysis. We have a lot of options, but you can't push yourself to make a decision about which of those options you do. Uh, so just because we have a lot of possibilities doesn't mean that we have the ability to decisively act on and make a decision. Next class, we're gonna get more into detail about this continuum, but I wanted to preview this to say that the Penn and Bob Schmidt continuum is a way of thinking about the ways that groups make decisions, ranging from an autocratic, which is just an authority figure who totally makes the decisions, a democratic system, which means that something like a majority vote could be the guiding force, or a participative system in which the decision is collaborative and involves everybody working together. Again, we'll revisit this more next class. What I do want to do, however, is in part two, of attendance. So I'm going to divide you into uh, based off of numbers and have you work on uh, this on your own. So uh, let's do one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. And then uh, Andrew, you're a one, Angela, you're a two, JB, you're a three, Alina, you're a four, Josie, you're a five, Caleb, you're a two, and Olivia, you're a three. If you're a one, you're assigned the plot. If you're a two, you're assigned delegation to an expert. If you're a three, you're averaging. If you're a four, you're voting. And if you're five, you are consensus. What I want you to do in the remaining two, uh, few minutes of class is to using the uh, strategy of decision-making you're assigned, 
just write down what you see as the benefits and challenges of this method and whether or not you would choose this method of reaching a solution if you were in a group yourself. Go ahead and wrap up the current sentence or thought you're working on. It's okay if you didn't complete all the parts, uh, but it is an opportunity for you to start brainstorming and thinking about some of these ideas as you gear up for uh, the next writing assignment in the class. So just to wrap up for today, um, we went over the small group assessment, which is going to be due on the 13th. Again, that's uh, not this Sunday, the following Sunday. Talked a little bit about decision making and its role in participation in group membership, and some of the different ways that we reach decisions and solutions with groups. So those are some core ideas that you're thinking about. For next class, we'll be discussing creativity and some of the additional ways that you can participate and be involved as you engage as a member of the group. We look forward to that. Please email or pass forward your attendance for today. And have a great rest of your day. I'll see you again on Wednesday.